Awesome. So uh, my, well, actually really fast, before I start this talk, uh, I have copied everyone else who helpfully put their slides up so that people at the back can see them if they need to. Um, Bundler versus Ruby Gems, GoRuko. Uh, you can find the slides if you need them. I already put them up on speaker deck. Um, okay, so to get started, um, I am Andre Arco. I'm indirect on all of the internet-y things. Um, I work for Cloud City Development in San Francisco where we do uh, Rails and general web development and consulting, and I also work on this thing that you may have heard of called Bundler. Um, so back to the real talk. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the story of programming disaster, overcoming adversity, and also how I accidentally launched a distributed de denial of service attack that took down rubygems.org. Uh, <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> Um, yeah, not, not the best thing ever. So the, the story of how this happened and what we did about it starts all the way many, many moons ago with uh, the very first release of Bundler, which was on the 30th of August in 2010, um, more or less simultaneous with the release of Rails 3.0. Yay. Um, so Ra Bundler 1.0 came out, and as you guys are probably aware at this point, Rails 3 also came out, and the biggest thing from the Bundler perspective that changed was that now you had to bundle install, and install, and install, and install. And it took a pretty long time. Um, so people weren't terribly happy about this. Uh, and I mean, what seemed like 10 minutes later at least, Someone sent me a link to this. Uh, <laughs> and I wasn't really sure how to take this, because apparently Rubyists are really sensitive to things being slow as long as that thing isn't Rails console. <laughs> um, yeah. So I said, I guess I should think about maybe trying to make this better. So I sat down, and the Bundler guys talked with the Ruby Gems guys, and we kind of came up with this plan, uh, mostly spearheaded by Nick Coranto, where he had this idea. RubyGems.org would provide an API just for Bundler with just the gems that you actually needed in your gem file, rather than Bundler having to go talk to RubyGems.org and download the entire list of every gem that has ever existed in the history of Ruby which is how Bundler 1.0 worked. It was a little slower. 1.1 um, with the API, so much faster, like a kind of toy gem file. I mean, it basically only had like Rails and two other gems in it. But bundle install from 1.0, 32 seconds. Bundle install 1.1, eight seconds. This is a pretty big improvement. Um, after uh, it was actually almost two years of pre-releases of Bundler 1.1, making sure we thought that all of the bugs were worked out. Um, Bundler 1.1 came out. Uh, this was the 7th of March, 2012. As you can see, there was a pretty big gap there between 1.0 and 1.1. But it came out, and we were really excited, and things were fast. Um, there was something that we completely failed to realize as this was happening, and it was mostly because almost no one ever runs gem install bundler dash dash pre. Um, they just run gem install bundler. And so it turns out, we discovered, from looking at the Ruby gem server, API requests are actually a lot of work for the server to serve. Um, all the way back in 2012, rubygems.org was hosted in its entirety on a single Rackspace VPS. There was a Postgres on it, there was a Redis on it, and there were a lot of unicorns on it, and that was the single internet choke point for all of the gems in the world. <laughs> um, so it turns out that significantly adding to the load on that box was not a viable long-term plan, as you may be mentally predicting at this moment. Um, so the way that that box worked is if you wanted to download a gem, it did a single database lookup, and then it returned a 302 so that you could go download your .gem file from CloudFront 
from some server that was actually fast and performant and spread all over the world and all the cool stuff. Um, but that's not how the API worked. How the API worked was it had to go and do a really complicated Postgres query with like where's and you know across basically the whole table, albeit with some indexes, and then it had to serialize all of the data that it had found into Ruby marshaled format, and then it had to send it down the pipe to Bundler, and then Bundler would come back asking for the next set of gems that it now knew that it needed based on the data that it had just gotten. And this usually went around in a circle maybe, I don't know, 10 or 20 times for every single time anyone ever ran bundle install. Um, so next, I'm gonna give you a bit of a dramatic reenactment of the rubygems.org ser server room. It's a time lapse um, in emoji. Uh, so this is February 2012 when there's basically Bundler core and we're the only people using the Bundler API. Uh, this is March 2012, which is when Bundler 1.1 was first officially released. Um, this is by about September, as a lot more people were actually installing Bundler 1.1 and running Bundle install on a regular basis. And this is around October. Um, so I don't know how many of you guys remember October last year, but that was when rubygems.org disappeared from the internet and all of the gems were gone. Um, turns out that that happened because rubygems.org didn't actually have enough CPU power to tell all of you which gems you needed. Um, so the entire API at that point was gone um, and everybody kind of freaked out and, oh no, why is it gone? We don't really understand what's happening. Everything seemed to be going so well. Um, and even as the rubygems.org team figured out how to get the box back up and running, they then discovered that it immediately went down again because now everyone was just sitting there rerunning bundle install <laughs> over and over and over <laughs> waiting for it to come back up. And it was still only one box. Um, so, the thing that I did not realize is that by October of last year, it wasn't just this, it was this, or this, or something, some really terrifying number of people who were now all really angry with torches and pitchforks that they couldn't install their application or deploy their application or whatever it was that they couldn't do because I had effectively destroyed rubygems.org. Crap. <laughs> So uh, we made a new plan, um, and hopefully learning from the lessons of failure, as, as the talk this morning pointed out, the only way to avoid failure is to have experience with it. So here was our experience, and uh, here, here's, here's our new attempt to avoid failure, which has actually gone pretty well so far. So uh, since hosting the Bundler API seemed pretty infeasible given the size of the infrastructure that rubygems.org was able to provide. Uh, the Bundler team, which at that point consisted of Terence Lee from Heroku and myself, sat down and said, hey, we could just re-implement the API part as a standalone app and then have rubygems.org send the API request to us and then we could scale it on Heroku because Heroku has this cool slider and says everything will be fine. <laughs> Um, so uh, we chatted with the rubygems.org guys and they actually said that that was okay with them, um, which, I mean, I guess that's good. Uh, so we built a, an app that we put on Heroku. Um, it's a really simple Sinatra app. Uh, it's like, I don't know, one page maybe of code total. Uh, and it talks to a Postgres database with the same data format as the rubygems.org database has. Um, but as we were building it and attempting to deploy it, we discovered that we had some really big questions about how it was going to work and about how it was working. And we were really, at this point, hopefully understandably worried about whether it was actually going to work once people started using it for real since that had gone so well last time. Um, so we wanted to know, could it support all of the Rubyists in the entire world? And could we scale it up past that since there seem to be more Rubyists all the time? Um, how is it slow? How does it compare to the old API? Do we need more servers? Do we need different kinds of servers? Is this like just not gonna scale and we're gonna have to come up with something completely new? Um, 
And then if we could answer those questions, what we really wanted to know is like, how can we make it even better than what we had when our only option was a few lines of Ruby code running on a single box? Um, so to answer those questions, we needed to be able to measure things. Turns out it's hard to answer questions if you don't have any data. Um, so in the end, we tried a lot of things, and this is kind of what we settled on as the most useful set of things. Um, we actually measure a whole lot of things around the whole new API and how it works and how users talk to it. Um, we actually have several Railsy web service thingies. I don't even know what to call those. So uh, among them, Librato, the metric service, and Paper Trail, the aggregated logging service, both donated accounts. Uh, PagerDuty, I'm totally forgetting the other companies' names, but they're on the Bundler website if you care to look, um, donated a bunch of really useful services that we're actively using with the API so that we can write as little code as possible but still get as much useful information out of the API as we can. Um, so we use Librato. Like I said, they do a metric service. Um, we use the metrics with a K, which is impossible to pronounce, gem. Um, but basically what that does is it lets you throw statistics at a server. Um, one of the supported backends is Librato. And the reason we use Librato is that it gives us pretty graphs that I hope you can see um, that basically just let us say, oh, here's when we started doing this thing, here's when we finished doing this thing, here's how many times this thing happened. And then we log into Librato and ta-da, there's graphs that tell us how it's going. Um, and then we're also using Paper Trail. Uh, it turns out that when you have, you know, however many different app servers we have running and we have background processes and foreground, you know, application servers and database logs and 25 different dynos. And Paper Trail is really awesome because all of those logs from all of those things just show up in a single window. And you can type what you want to see, and it shows you only that stuff. Um, so having all of that data, we discovered that measuring things leads to us actually knowing how they're doing. Um, and boy, did we not know how we were doing, it turns out. Um, so from having talked with the rubygems.org team back when the API was actually hosted on that, that one poor VPS that we nuked, uh, API requests typically took somewhere between half a second and two seconds, um, but we didn't really have like solid metrics on it. And we also knew that there were slow requests that sometimes took up to 20 entire seconds to be served, which blew my mind when I heard that because that just does not seem like that's gonna work out ever if you think that's normal. Um, so we instrumented everything in our new API so that we would know if anything like that was happening, and we made some actually pretty interesting discoveries. So this is kind of a mini tour through the discoveries that were totally non-obvious to me that we discovered through having loads of metrics. Um, the first discovery is that Postgres is fast. This is not the part that was not obvious to me. Uh, so it seems kind of obvious that databases will be somewhat fast. Um, I mean, the entire rubygems.org database turns out to be, it's a very small data set. It's basically just metadata about the gems and the like text of the gem spec. Um, so like gzip, the entire database dump is like 40 megabytes. Completely uncompressed, it's like 200 megabytes, maybe 250. So we said, oh, okay, like that means we can use a tiny Postgres um, Heroku offers Postgres's by the size of the data that you keep in them, um, kind of with the idea that as you have bigger data, you're going to need a bigger box holding that data to get data out of it quickly. Um, so we were like, hey, we put our data in the Postgres, seems pretty fast, database queries take like five to 15 milliseconds. Um, median response time for our entire like instrumented web application stack was like maybe 80 milliseconds. Seems pretty good. Um, we realized, thanks to Librato, um, earlier today it was mentioned that New Relic is providing averages, which are not the whole story. We found that to be extremely true. Um, turns out that the 95th percentile response times, even when our, our median response time was 80 milliseconds, our 95th percentile response times were around 600 milliseconds, which is a really big something to not know, that there are people sitting around waiting for 
six or seven times as long as the number that you're seeing as you're like, this is how long a request takes. Um, so the huge discovery that we made while attempting to see if there was something we could do about that relatively bad 95th percentile number is that big Postgres is way faster. Um, we, thinking that it probably wouldn't make that much of a difference, but why not try it since Heroku had already donated the hosting? Uh, we loaded up the same tiny data set in one of the, like, I don't actually know what the Heroku level is called, but the Mecha Godzilla Postgres level. Um, and oh my god, it was so fast. Uh, we started getting queries back in like two to five milliseconds, no matter how complicated they were. And I just went, wow, okay, this is awesome. Like, we can, this is gonna make everything so much faster. Uh, it dropped our median response times because we were having to do a bunch of dependent queries. It dropped our median response time from like 80 down to 20 milliseconds. It was like four times faster once you factored in that huge database speed improvement. And our 95th percentile times dropped all the way down to like 200, 225 milliseconds, which is like, holy shit, that's awesome. I'm ecstatic, right? Uh, so the next thing that we discovered as we were basically just trying everything, no matter how dumb it seemed, to see whether it was faster or slower, Redis caching, at least for us, made things slower as long as it was on. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> um, and this isn't actually a Redis joke. Uh, it turns out that the way that the API had actually originally been architected was like, Bundler sends a list of gems. Ruby gem says, okay, I will figure out all of the gems that those gems need, and I'll send them back. And we thought, hey, like we have a, a set here. Like if this set ever gets requested again, let's just keep that, and then we won't have to recalculate it, we won't have to remarshal it, we won't have to re-anything it. We can just send it straight off. Um, well, there were two things that we didn't really realize until, in retrospect, we were figuring out why it was actually slow, uh, and the why it was actually slow was nobody ever has the same gem file twice ever. Um, like maybe your project will have the same gem file the next time you bundle install, but that means that we were getting cache hits like 1% or less of the time, and that is not really gonna be very helpful. And then the other thing that we discovered is that new gems get pushed every two or three minutes. So that 1% cache rate was only if you were one of the 1% of requests in the first two or three minutes after the last request for the same gem file. So we were actually spending more time sending that data to Redis and waiting to hear back that we had saved it than we were ever avoiding work as a result of having had that saved, which blew my mind again. This, this project is just full of things that blew my mind apparently. Um, right, so we just didn't actually use that, that cache at all. Um, so recalculating those requests all the time meant that it was actually slower to have caching in Redis turned on. And so we turned it off and things got a little bit faster. Um, the next discovery that we made is that threading is really super great. Um, it's been kind of in the news lately, uh, but the way that Heroku's router works is effectively just random selection because when you hit one of their routers from outside, it doesn't have shared state with all of the other routers that you could potentially be hitting. So it just randomly picks a dyno and sends the request to that dyno. Um, if you have a single threaded web server, this is basically the worst possible thing that could happen to you. And it turns out that Sinatra, if you don't do anything to it, is single threaded, just like Rails, if you don't do anything to it, is single threaded. Um, so we thought, hey, there's this cool new, uh, what is that even called? App, uh, like in Ruby application server called Puma, written by Evan Phoenix. Um, and it's kind of attempting to be the spiritual, more or less, successor to Mongrel. Um, and it has threading built in. And that's totally cool. We can just spin up some Pumas and say, hey, Puma, run 16 threads that all serve requests. Um, so we were really excited about this because in the kind of like real world use case, if you have a single threaded server, you need like, even if you have theoretically 10 dynos worth of traffic, 
you actually need, if you do the math on it, something like 200 or 300 dynos to serve that 10 dynos worth of traffic because of the way that traffic backs up behind slow requests on the dynos that you do have thanks to the random routing. So we thought, okay, problem totally solved. And then we started to notice that about once a day for no particularly apparent reason, one of those dynos would just stop ever sending responses ever again. And it would stay up and it would respond to, you know, like, are you there? It would open connections, it would accept sockets, it would accept data download sockets, and then nothing would ever come back from them, which is like the worst possible failure case, right? Like, <laughs> uh, so, after a totally ridiculous amount of debugging, including running S-Trace on live dynos, we discovered that deadlocks are not so great, and there was something in Puma that I honestly have no idea to this day if it's still there or not, um, that just meant for our exact use case, every once in a while, Puma would hit a deadlock with a user space mutex, and it would just never recover. <laughs> um, so, Eventually, because I didn't have time to debug that and I had no idea how any of that worked anyway, uh, I said, okay, I give up. I'm just gonna use Thin. That actually runs. Our requests are actually getting served. I'm gonna move on. Um, so I did that. Like, I actually just changed the proc file to use Thin instead and I stopped seeing that particular problem and said, okay, great, problem solved. I, not really, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, the next discovery that we made is that keeping track of things is really, really hard. Um, just knowing, like, how many people were actually using it at any given time in a way that was meaningful to us in terms of, like, how many dinos do we need? How many dinos do we need worst case? How many dinos do we need so that we're not, like, making Heroku think it was a bad decision to have sponsored this in the first place? Uh, it's really hard to figure that out, actually. Um, metrics are also really tricky. Um, so the first thing that we started doing as we were trying to figure out the answer to the capacity question was uh, at that point, Heroku provided a dynos in use header along with every request. And so it turned out that if you actually tracked that and averaged it across all of the requests that were coming in at the same time, you got a pretty reasonable graph of like, oh, you're actually continuously using X dynos in this, in this minute worth of requests. Um, the thing is, after the router gate or whatever you wanna call that happened, uh, they reworked the way that the router worked to provide theoretically more useful routing information, but they took out that dynos in use header because I guess whatever they changed meant that they couldn't provide it anymore. Um, and so we were kind of back at ground zero and we knew that we were running a single threaded system now that Routergate had happened that meant we were really worried about capacity in general. Uh, and so we weren't really sure what to do now that we had no idea how many dynos we were using and we had no idea if we were you know, overloading those dynos because we didn't really have visibility into that. Uh, so, eventually, all of this stuff is really hard, but kind of what we figured out in the end is that we could at least keep track of any time the routers saw a problem, which effectively put them outside of our app stack and out of the dynos that we were using. Um, and so, thanks to Paper Trail, we had a full aggregate log of every time there was an error either inside our app or outside our app where a router made a request and the dyno or the app server on the dyno wasn't able to serve that request fast enough for the router to be happy. Um, and so it turns out that Paper Trail actually has this cool thing where you can set up a search in Paper Trail and then plug it into Librato so that you can graph how many times that log line shows up per minute. And then we aggregated all of those possible different kinds of errors into a single graph, and so there was then one graph that we could look at and be like, well, the routers are happy, the app servers are happy, the app code itself is happy, the database is happy, seems like things are probably okay and we don't need more dynos. Um, so kind of the lesson that we took away from this is like monitor 
all of those things simultaneously because if you miss one of them, that will be the one that is completely broken and screwing you without you knowing it. Um, the final thing that we did once we had all that cool stuff hooked up is that we were actually able to tell Librato that if, say for example, the number of failures that the routers were seeing ever got higher than maybe like a couple of minute to then send an alert to PagerDuty and say, hey guys, your, your app may still be up, but you're failing to serve a bunch of requests that people actually want you to serve because you're under capacity and that that's how we handle like knowing that we need more dynos but without having cranked the dial up all the time costing Heroku a bajillion dollars. It's actually worked out really well. Very happy about that. Um, as part of investigating the capacity thing though, we made another discovery that I guess again blew my mind. Uh, turns out that response times are all lies. Like all of those numbers that you see reported by your application on how long it took to do stuff, like that is in fact a number. <laughs> <laughs> But that's not the number that the person asking you for that stuff saw, right? Like, you have no idea what the number of the person asking you for stuff saw, because that person had to talk to an internet router, and then had to talk to a Heroku router, and then had to talk to, like, the Dynos network stack, and then had to talk to the unicorn master process, and then had to talk to the unicorn child process, and then had to talk to all of your middlewares, and then had to talk to your underlying Sinatra or Rails app, and then had to reverse the entire process. And some significant chunk of that just does not end up in the number that you see when you graph how long my request took to process. Um, so uh, even though, as I said, we had this really exciting median response time number of 20 milliseconds, I was like, that's amazing. How is that even possible? I've never even heard of anything that fast. Well, it, it wasn't possible. Uh, so, as we were seeing that graph, once we actually set something up on the outside that was, we, we actually wound up spinning up an entire additional Heroku app that does nothing except talk to this Heroku app and occasionally make requests and then send data about that to Librato so that we get another graph of like, hey, if you're not actually inside the app process, what's going on? Um, turns out that at that point, 5% of external requests were timing out. Oh, shit. Uh, wow, we had a 20 millisecond median response time. Uh, yeah, so totally not okay, right? Um, so, right, so check it from the outside because what your app server is telling you like could be completely right if it is, please tell me how you did that, because I've never seen that happen. Um, and so armed with that information of 5% of requests are completely timing out, we went back and re-looked at the single-threaded thing, and it turns out that it was totally Thin's fault, because Thin was running a single, you know, level of concurrency one. Every dyno was only able to serve one request at a time. And even if you're serving 20 millisecond requests, like you get two 600 millisecond requests in a row and suddenly all the ones behind it are now backed up by a second and a half and that happens again and that happens again and eventually some set of 20 millisecond requests is now timing out at the 30 second router timeout because they're backed up behind enough slow and fast requests that they just can't make it back out. Um, so what we wound up doing to solve that is we started using double-sized dynos so that we had lots of RAM, and we switched to using Unicorn to try and get as much concurrency as we could out of our single-threaded processes. And we're now running like 16 or 24 Unicorn child processes on each dyno, and that at least gets us back up to roughly where we were with Puma with 16 threads, but without any deadlocks because everything's running in a separate process. So we basically sacrifice RAM to get around deadlocks that I don't know how to debug. Um, so, it's all good now, right? We had all these problems, we solved all these problems. Totally fantastic. Um, well, you know, mostly better. Uh, then we started seeing these really weird bug reports. Like, I ran bundle update and it updated me to a gem that's yanked. Wait, what? Uh, 
So I, I have news, and honestly, this is probably not news to very many of you, but synchronizing, it's really hard. Uh, so obviously, now that they were two completely independent services, rubygems.org and the Bundler API no longer shared a database, which meant that we had to somehow keep them in sync. And so our initial attempt was we basically built a rake task that ran a background process that fetched the entire multi-megabyte index from rubygems.org, and then one item at a time said, hey, is this in our database? Hmm, nope. Is this in our database? Yep. Is this in our database? Oh, it got yanked, okay. And it had to do that for every single gem, every however many minutes it could, as fast as it could, and needless to say, this was a lot of database load and a lot of CPU load, and it was really, really slow. Um, it also needed a lot of memory, so much memory, in fact, that the background process would regularly crash while it was in the middle of updating our database because it just didn't have enough RAM. Um, and so we said, well, this probably isn't gonna work long term. Uh, and so we switched over to a webhook-based system where the rubygems.org administrators were nice and they said, well, like, we don't do this for anyone else, but we'll just give you custom webhooks where we won't, we'll synchronously tell you that there's a new gem. And we won't even return from gem push until we've told you that there's a new gem because that means that when it returns from gem push, they can run bundle install and it'll actually work and you'll stop getting all those angry rants from people who are like, I ran gem push and bundle install is broken and what's wrong with you? Uh, <laughs> so that turned out to have another problem, which is that webhooks aren't actually terribly reliable. <laughs> uh, so every once in a while, I would just have to read through the exception log and be like, ah oh, yes, we don't have that gem, we don't have that gem, we don't have that gem, we don't. So I was manually running gem update processes with the names of the gems that showed up in the exception logs so that I knew that we were up to date. <laughs> this doesn't really scale either. Um, eventually, we kind of settled on a hybrid approach that's pretty decent, like where we process all the webhooks that we get notified about, and then rather than running the background process in a continuous loop that eventually leaks enough RAM that it crashes, we just execute it once every 30 or, 30 or 60 minutes, I don't remember which, and it does one single process and then shuts down to wait for the next time period, which means that the, the Bundler API is never more than 30 or 60 minutes out of date, but most of the time it's actually completely up to date. Um, which is pretty great. Like, after all that, bundling's pretty fast. Like, we're back to at least as fast as it was before, and honestly, like, now that the app server times are two orders of magnitude faster, it seems faster to use, too, which is pretty great. Like, I am really, really excited about this change in particular. Like, fuck yeah. Um, thank you. So having said all that, I mean, still, it's, it's okay, I guess, right? Like, we can do way, way better than what we have now. Um, and we even have a plan for it. Uh, like, we've, I've, I, we, we. Uh, so we, as in the Bundler team, and we, as in the Bundler and RubyGems and RubyGems.org teams, have all kind of been talking about how the situation is less than ideal, all things considered. And we have an even better plan. And that plan is to implement a new index format for both the rubygems.org server and for Bundler and for RubyGems. And it's going to be append only, and it's going to be plain text, and it's going to be cacheable, and it's going to be updatable with HTTP range requests, and it'll be totally awesome once it's implemented. And we even have a working prototype implementation that functions, and we benchmarked it, and it's as fast as the current format, which makes me really ecstatic, actually. Uh, once all of that is done, Bundler will already know about basically all of the gems that exist, and it'll just have to do one little quick request to say, hey, is there anything I don't know about yet? And if there's anything it doesn't know about yet, that's all it'll have to learn about before it starts Bundle installing. That will be totally awesome. Um, so towards that end, uh, Ruby Central, I'm really excited to announce, 
has given me a grant to spend a day or two a week over the next five or six months actually working on this exact problem. Um, I'm totally ecstatic about that too. Like I'm really hopeful that that is enough time to just completely finish this and be able to tell all you guys by you know, later this year, hey, it's totally awesomely fast now and you can never think about sitting there and watching Bundler Fetch from Ruby Gems again. Um, that said, even with the Ruby Central grant, you, yes, all of you, you can help. Um, we have a plan. The plan still includes way more work than one guy working a couple days a week can actually accomplish. Um, some totally awesome people have already volunteered to try and help with this. If you have time or inclination to work on this, um, there are some totally awesome opportunities ranging from improving documentation all the way up through fixing bugs in the resolver if that's your particular CS bent. Um, we're even launching as a Rails Girl Summer of Code project, which I'm also really excited about. Uh, we have either one or two pairs of girls who have actually said that they want to, assuming that they get their applications approved, uh, work on Bundler as their like summer project. Like This is gonna be totally awesome. If you want to help Rails girls get started on open source as Bundler developers, like that would also be an awesome way you could volunteer. Uh, so, operators are standing by. Please feel free to contact me or anyone else on the Bundler core team, and we would love to hook you up and get help from you. Thanks.